I'm having a really hard time with this video. It's like TNA does some things that I've been wanting them to do, but the way they did them almost makes me wish they hadn't. I mean, there, there were a lot of frustrating things here. Uh, the card for Lockdown looks really good for the most part, but the way they're getting there is kind of giving me a bad taste in my mouth. You know, most of the matches I, I can't even talk about this week because I didn't see them. I blinked, and I missed them. They were that short. But there's two matches on Impact here that I need to go over. First, you had Samoa Joe versus Booker T in the second round of the Man Advantage Challenge for Lethal Lockdown. Samoa Joe and Booker T is a rematch from the main events of Victory Road and Hard Justice from last year. That's a big match with two of TNA's biggest stars. So naturally, they give this match less than two minutes. They have tons of interference, and then Booker T gets pinned after one slam. Look, I do appreciate that they're pushing Samoa Joe at, like a monster who can destroy anyone, but Booker T getting pinned that quickly and that easily was just ridiculous. You want Joe to look like a beast? Fine. Have him beat down Booker T for 10 or 15 minutes and then pin him. I, I know 15 minutes is probably more wrestling than Vince Russo wants to have on a two-hour show, but Jesus, I bet those fans in the Impact Zone were really pissed off that match was so short. Plus, there's how the whole thing was presented. First you go and you, you make Booker T the babyface in this match by having him get all distraught about, Samo about what Samoa Joe did to Charmel. I mean, they definitely played the sympathy card with Booker T's promo before the match, so Booker looks like the face and Joe looks like the heel. Then you have Kurt Angle interfere on Booker T's behalf during the match, which makes Booker look like the heel again. Now, I know this is something that Vince Russo loves to do, blurring the lines between faces and heels, but when you blur them when you blow them to such an extent that people officially have no idea who to cheer for, then you're taking it too far. Look, you can either cheer for the heel, or you can cheer for the babyface, who apparently did something really horrifying to the heel's wife. Or you can just get confused and not cheer for either person. The second match I need to go over was Motor City Machine Guns versus Mick Foley. Now, I like that the writers didn't just leave this story thread dangling. You know, it makes sense that Alex Shelley would want payback after Foley embarrassed him in the Turkey Bowl show last year. But I don't think they could have found a worse way to present this if they tried. Foley makes it a first blood match. Not really necessary, but so be it. They have the match, Sting comes out to watch, and I'm thinking, you know, Foley said in an interview recently that he's a fan of the Motor City Machine Guns, so maybe he'll make them look strong here. And they looked alright at first, you know, Foley let them get in a good amount of offense. But then Sting attacks Saban, because Saban mocked him for two seconds. And Sting is a holier-than-thou prick and thinks Saban deserved to get dropped on his head for that. So then Mick does the mandible claw on Shelley, draws blood, and beats the guns in a handicap match. Then he restarts the match and promises to carve up Shelley like into, carve Alex Shelley into confetti. So then Sting hits Foley with a chair, draws blood, and the guns win. Okay, there's a lot wrong with this. First of all, you made Saban and Shelley look weak for losing, and then only winning because of Sting. Second, the match wasn't even really about them, it was about Sting and Foley, which is understandable because they're in the main event of lockdown, but some of the stuff Sting did made no sense whatsoever. Sting wants Foley to lose the match, but the first thing he did was take out Saban and help Foley win. And why? Well, because Saban made fun of him by doing this. Jesus, Sting, descend from your golden pedestal and get over yourself already. And then, when Foley says that he's going to really fuck Shelly up now, Sting then interferes and stops him from doing it. And here's the problem. Okay, maybe the writers don't remember this, but I do. When Sting first came into TNA, they did an angle where Alex Shelley was following Sting, Sting and his kids around with a video camera, which really pissed Sting off. Now, something like that is not something Sting, or any parent for that matter, would ever forget. So if I'm Sting, I hate Mick Foley, I hate Alex Shelley, I hear Foley announce that he's going to carve up Shelley like a Thanksgiving turkey, I'm thinking, cool, tear that little punk a new asshole, Mick, I'll let you do that, and then I'll cave in your skull with this steel chair after you're done. But the way this whole thing played out made no sense. You made the guns look weak, and you made Sting's behavior look really confusing. Alright, what they should have done was just have Sting watch the match, have the announcers mention his history with both Foley and Shelley, and not be sure what Sting's going to do. Have the match go for a while, with the guns getting in most of the offense because it is two-on-one, but not being able to draw blood because they're kind of out of their element in a match like this. Then have Sting hit Foley with the chair so the guns win, and then he hits Shelley with the chair afterward. The guns look good because they got a lot of offense and a big star, and they didn't lose. 
Foley looks good because he took a two-on-one beatdown and still only lost because of Sting. And you acknowledge the storyline that Sting had with Alex Shelley and the feud with Foley without getting all confusing. They also announced a full lockdown card this week. I was kind of struck by something when I saw this. The three big matches are Sting and Foley, Lethal Lockdown, and Beer Money 3D. But a lot of the undercard has almost no buildup at all. Okay, X Division Escape match, no buildup. Queen of the Cage match, no buildup. Motor City LAX No Limit, next to no buildup. And this really makes me think that the writers have been focusing on the Sting Foley match too much. I mean, if this was two different guys, I'd be thrilled that TNA was putting so much emphasis on hyping the main event of Lockdown. But with Sting and Foley, it looks like they're putting most of their eggs in one basket with a match that probably isn't even going to be that good and relying on that to sell the pay-per-view. And for that to work, this match is going to have to deliver in a way that it probably won't. I mean, there wouldn't be so much pressure on Sting and Foley if you'd spent some time building up the undercard matches. And the two women's matches are really bugging me right now. The Knockouts title match is Kong, Taylor, and Angelina. No surprises there, although I still think Roxy got screwed over by not getting a spot in this match. Angelina's placement here does not make, does not make much sense. All right, yes, she's been really prominent lately, but the fact remains that the beautiful people have not won a match on pay-per-view since Turning Point 2007. So what exactly has Angelina done to earn a title match? Hey, the beautiful people scoring a few rare wins on Impact late, late, uh, recently does not move them up the ladder that much. Their credibility is still practically zero. And then there's another problem with the fact that Angelina and Kong don't have much chemistry. You know, I don't think they've ever had a one-on-one -on -one match on Impact, but they have fought in multi-person matches a few times, and it never looked very good. I mean, Kong and Angelina isn't a very good matchup, which explains Taylor being in there because Taylor can have a, go a very good match with Kong and or Angelina, but they really haven't justified Angelina being in there. A second match is a fatal four-way with ODB, Daphne, Madison Rain, and some Jobber Bolt. They're calling this the Queen of the Cage, even though it really isn't, but I assume the stipulation is still winner gets a title shot. And three of these women have absolutely no business fighting for a title shot right now. ODB has barely wrestled in the last few months, and the last time we saw her in the ring, I think, was at Against All Odds, where she lost to Awesome Kong in a pretty short match that was not even that good. Madison Rain has not won a single match yet, so how on earth does she get to fight for a title shot? And Bolt? Why? TNA, do you really want to give this woman another chance to embarrass your company on one of your biggest pay-per-views? Was her performance at Destination X not painful enough to watch? Hey, she hasn't even been on, been on TV since then, which I hope means that the writers are starting to realize that she's not that talented. So I'm going to assume that some jobber bolt is going to live up to her name here and be the designated jobber in this match. Hopefully her role won't amount to much more than that. The only person who should be in this match is Daphne. Daphne won at the la Daphne's team won at the last pay-per-view. She beat Madison Rain in a match on Impact, and she and Abyss will beat ODB and Cody Deaner in a mixed tag this Thursday. Yes, I read the spoilers, so sue me. So Daphne does at least look somewhat credible right now. The other three do not belong in this match at all. If it was just Daphne, Rain, and Bolt, then at least you could bill it as the three new knockouts getting a chance to make a name for themselves and earn a title shot. But when you throw ODB in there too, then it's just a match with four random people, three of which should not even be there. Hopefully Daphne will win by pinning Bolt. That's as much as I can ask for right now. That's all I got. See you next week for the Go Home Show. Later.